Hello, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, Education Specialist of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to this presentation of the ASRM Grand Rounds webinar series. These webinars are designed to address topics in the ABOG Learning Guide in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Today's presentation is by Dr. G. Wright Bates, Jr. Dr. Bates is Professor and Director of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. The title of this talk today is Ovarian Compartmentalization and Steroidogenesis. I will now review the details of today's presentation. After the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your continuing education credits. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. If you wish to ask a question to the speaker about this presentation, when you return to ASRM eLearn, click on the page link labeled questions and an email address will be provided. We're very excited for our talk today, so I will now turn things over to our speaker. Hello and welcome. Um, I'm Dr. Wright Bates, and today we're going to review a topic that uh, can be quite daunting to trainees in reproductive endocrinology. Uh, fellows and students have historically struggled with what's commonly known as chicken wire or steroidogenesis. And I have to say that in my 26 years of practice, being a clinician, educator, and clinical researcher, it's something that I continually refresh and, in fact, have a copy of the steroidogenesis permanently affixed under the glass of my desk. Um, I do think it's an important area of study and one that's not only crucial for the um, achieving certification, but also important to the daily practice of reproductive endocrinology and the optimal care of our patients. I have no relevant financial uh, disclosures uh, with any commercial interest uh, relating to this topic. Today, we will, I'll provide you with an overview of steroidogenesis. We'll describe the levels of compartmentalization of steroidogenic activity or steroidogenesis within the ovary. We'll specifically highlight the uh, two delta-5 and the one delta-4 pathway that are active within the ovary, uh, and also discuss the changes associated with steroidogenesis uh, in the menstrual cycle. And finally, uh, discuss some political, uh, some clinical implications um, of alterations in ovarian steroidogenesis. So first of all, what is a steroid or what is steroidogenesis? Uh, simply put, steroidogenesis is the production of fat-soluble organic compounds, including sterols and sex hormones, most of which have specific physiologic action. I would argue that they all have action uh, of some type. We just may not completely understand that action at this point. And we all are very familiar with the sex steroids, estrogen, progesterone, and the androgens, which are produced uh, in the ovary in response to hypothalamic and pituitary stimulation. Uh, when we talk about compartmentalization, uh, one of the things that first comes to mind is the um, hypothalamic pituitary and ovarian axis. Although the full gamut of this system is beyond the scope of this talk, it is important to um, begin with the regulation of ovarian function that's mediated uh, from the master conductor that is the hypothalamus. As you know, the uh, hypothalamus releases GnRH in a pulsatile fashion uh, with pulses every uh, 60 to 90 minutes uh, and a very short half-life of two to four minutes, allowing for very fine-tuning or precise modulation of pituitary function, which is FSH and luteinizing hormone. Uh, and the frequency and amplitude of FSH and LH likewise determine the end product uh, of the ovary, which as I met, mentioned is estrogens, progesterone, and the androgens. Uh, since this topic, uh, as the title indicates, is focusing on compartmentalization relative to the ovary, I think it's important to first note 
the compartmentalization um, may include many specific categories. Clearly, steroidogenesis occurs in many places throughout the body, in organs such as the adrenal gland, the ovary, the testes, the liver, and the placenta. Um, you'll also notice that I included fat, and fat does meet the definition of a gland or an organ, i.e. a group of tissues or a structural unit uh, within the body with a specific function. It's interesting, as if you Google fat as an organ, you'll get that it's the biggest organ in our bodies, um, largely owing to the epi uh, obesity epidemic. It's also been called the least understood organ in the body, and finally the deadliest because of its impact on cardiovascular function, um, especially with truncal obesity or visceral fat. While fat is a, a well-known site of production of estrogen, uh, in particular, um, our focus today, as mentioned, will be on the ovary. Within the ovary, there are multiple layers of compartmentalization. Um, the well-known two-cell theory that we'll spend considerable amount of our time today discussing, the theca and the granulosa cells. Um, also, specific organelles within the cell are involved in steroidogenesis. And finally, there is variable production or changes in steroidogenesis, changes in steroidogenic enzymes throughout the menstrual cycle that are important uh, even to the practicing uh, reproductive endocrinologists. This slide highlights the classic chicken wire, uh, fortunately without the uh, ring structures, but gives you an overview of the uh, transition from cholesterol to the end products of mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, um, and the sex steroids, um, the estrogens, um, and the androgens, as well as progesterone. To get a little more detail, um, we look at this next slide that highlights many things that are very important to our understanding of steroidogenesis. Um, of note, this has been described as the most popular presentation of the steroidogenic uh, pathway on the internet, and I think it's very intuitive and informative. The first thing you see is cholesterol undergoing um, cholesterol uh, side uh, chain cleavage to be metabolized to pregnenolone. I mentioned that compartmentalization also refers to organelles as well as organs and even time frame relative to the menstrual cycle. But this slide highlights the fact that the cytochrome P450 side chain cleavage enzyme, the aldosterone synthetase enzyme, and 11-beta hydroxylase all occur within the mitochondria. The remainder of the steroidogenic enzymes occur within the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and with the conversion of estrone and estradiol to estriol, specifically taking place in the liver and the placenta, whereas the majority of tissues in our body, or many tissues in our body, do have uh, the, the other steroidogenic uh, potential. Just a word about the cholesterol, and it's very important to note that cholesterol in and of itself cannot enter the mitochondria. It must be transferred from the outer mitochondrial membrane to the inner mitochondrial membrane where the side chain cleavage, or P450 SCC enzyme, that's coded on uh, CYP11A1, keeping up with the genetic side, occurs. This is accomplished by the STAR, or the steroidogenic acute regulatory protein. Uh, essentially, the aqueous phase between the two membranes don't allow the lipophilic cholesterol uh, to pass without a system. Many proteins have been proposed as playing a role in facilitating this transfer, but it does appear that the major player and the, the one to remember for our purposes is the STAR, our steroidogenic acute regulatory protein. Uh, the exact mechanism that is involved in this transfer of cholesterol across the cell membrane is not completely understood. Uh, we'll discuss some modulators uh, of this. Um, and basically anything that stimulates uh, cholesterol um, metabolism and steroidogenesis 
is thought to impact uh, the star. So far, as I mentioned, uh, the star has been found in all tissues that produce steroids and definitely found within the adrenal cortex and the ovary as well as the human placenta. Um, it's interesting to note that not only is there endocrine, paracrine, and autocrine regulation of steroidogenesis that we'll highlight numerous times in this review, but environmental things also play a role. Uh, most noteworthy is that alcohol consumption impacts the uh, star activity. So cholesterol is not able to enter the cell. Steroidogenesis um, may be directly impacted if with uh, alcohol consumption. Uh, focusing just on the area of the ovary, this is our first introduction to the delta-4 and delta-5 pathways that we'll spend a few minutes discussing. Uh, this slide nicely highlights the rate-limiting role of the STAR CYP11A, the cytochrome P450 side chain cleavage um, enzyme that begins the process and is thought to be the rate-limiting step. Now, you will hear endocrinologists talk about the rate-limiting step of estrogen production in the ovary, and that um, can be legitimately referred to as aromatization, um, but the overall steroidogenic pathway um, is controlled by the metabolism of cholesterol uh, to pregnenolone. Um, this is the, the initial and rate-limiting step. Uh, one goes from a C27 cholesterol to a C21 uh, pregnenolone. Um, the catalyzation there we've talked about at length um, with numerous factors uh, believed to be involved in this rate-limiting step. Now, continuing our theme of compartmentalization, very early in the process, there's a crucial dichotomization or fork in the road, uh, to use a colloquial term, regarding steroidogenesis. Um, this involves the delta-5 and delta-4 pathways of, of pregnenolone metabolism. The delta-5 pathway proceeds via the cytochrome P450 17-alpha hydroxylase or the CYP17, eventually leading to androgen production. And it's very important to note, especially in keeping with our compartmentalization theme, that CYP17 is only found in the fecal cells and not in the granulosa cells, you know, providing a physiologic basis for the well-known thought that fecal cells produce androgens and granulosa cells produce um, estrogen uh, using the androgen cells as substrate processed through aromatization. The second pathway is delta-4, and we'll highlight that also in more detail. And essentially, pregnenolone is metabolized to progesterone through 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase and then to 17-hydroxyprogesterone, um, also via the CYP17 cytochrome P450. It's important to note that this enzyme has uh, multiple functions, and that may allow for modulation and determine which pathway the pregnenolone enters for metabolism or steroidogenesis. It's also important to note there's very little of the 17-hydroxyprogesterone, if any, con converted to androstenedione. dione. If you look at the typical steroidogenesis pathway, what you see is 17-hydroxyprogesterone um, and aligned androstenedione. While this does occur in the corpus luteum, in general, progesterone and 17-hydroxyprogesterone are the end result of the delta-4 pathway and do not uh, result in appreciable um, androgen productions. As I mentioned, the delta-5 uh, pathway occurs to 17-hydroxyprogesterone, which essentially you have hydroxylation of the pregnenolone um, at the C17 position that yields the 17-hydroxyprogesterone. Uh, um, just to pause for a minute, many of you may be wondering, or maybe not, you know, why the Delta-4 and why the Delta-5? Uh, it helps me to think about the uh, chemical name for pre pregnenolone really highlights the fact 
Um, you see pregnenolone, 5-ene, 3 beta oil, 20 ohm that's converted to the, the pregnenine, 4-ene, 320-down. So essentially, delta-4, delta commonly associated with change, is a change in the double bond from C5 to C4. It would seem to be a little bit backwards if you don't think about the double bond because delta-5 actually, in most toroidogenic tables, our diagram occurs sooner. So here you see the red circle highlighting the location of the pregnenolone and the conversion of pregnenolone to 17-hydroxylase to 17-hydroxypregnenolone and then through 17-20-lyase to DHEA, androstenedione, diol, and then through 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase to the precursors androstenedione and testosterone that ultimately lead to estradiol and estrone um, production. Once again, the red circle just highlights the, the location in the delta-5 pathway of the, the double bond does not change. Now compare that to the delta-4 pathway where um, through 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase pregnenolone is converted to progesterone and then to 17-hydroxyprogesterone through the same cytochrome P450 17-alpha. However, in this case, the pregnenolone double bond changes from the 5 to the 4 position. Uh, notice the other red line, and that just highlights the fact that you know, in humans, the conversion of 17-hydroxyprogesterone to androstenedione is not a common occurrence, if at all. So basically, to summarize, you have an irreversible dehydrogenase reaction catalyzed by 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Progesterone is then converted um, to 17-hydroxyprogesterone. And in general, in humans, 17-hydroxyprogesterone um, is not further metabolized and is the end product. Interesting to note that in both rodents and guinea pigs, that's not the case. If you're a researcher uh, in those areas or have a special interest or a pet, um, you'll be happy to know that they have a different steroidogenic pathway with very active 1720 lyase, um, very active conversion of 17 hydroxyprogesterone to androstenedione. dione. And it should be noted that it can be difficult to find interesting tidbits when one is discussing uh, steroidogenesis. So in humans, progesterone and our 17-hydroxyprogesterone are produced by the granulosa cells, and the only route for estradiol synthesis uh, in the human ovary is the delta-5 pathway uh, that we alluded to earlier. Now, what does 17-hydroxyprogesterone, what role does it play? Um, not completely understood. We know that in the adrenal cortex, 7-hydroxyprogesterone uh, um, may modulate the biologic activity of cortisol, and one can then theorize that in the ovary, 7-hydroxyprogesterone mediates uh, any potential inflammatory reaction uh, associated with ovulation and disruption of the ovarian capsule. To highlight this regulation of the delta-4 or delta-5 pathways, Basically, the question is why, in what cases does pregnenolone proceed um, to the end point of androgen production via the delta-5 pathway versus the delta-4 pathway? And we'll, we'll discuss a little bit later about the impact of the um, endocrine function associated with changes in the menstrual cycle. But as I mentioned, the CYP17 has both hydroxylase and lyase, um, really with post-translational regulation. Um, it's a good point here to mention that many things regulate this process that we'll highlight sh shortly, including a host of genetic um, modifiers and potential um, abnormalities associated um, with uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, various mutations. Uh, the genetics of steroidogenesis is a one or two or even more talks in and of itself. So largely, we'll focus on endocrine, paracrine, and autocrine modulation of the steroidogenic pathway 
um, with little mention of the genetic determinants over the, other than the genes that specifically code for each enzyme. So lyase activity, to begin with the uh, discussion of modulation, um, depends uh, entirely on the availability of electrons from NADP. Multiple factors play a role in this electron transfer, uh, including serine phosphorylation, as well as allosteric effects of cytochrome B5 or the close proximity and binding of, of the cytochrome B5. The obligatory electron donor is cytochrome P450 oxidoreductase, also known as POR, and specifically the ratio of POR to cytochrome 17 increases the lyase activity over the hydroxylase activity, so allows for careful modulation. Basically, the greater availability of electron donation relative to the presence of the CYP17 enzyme, the greater lyase function versus hydroxylase. Uh, conversely, uh, dephosphorylation completely eliminates lyase function and would favor um, hydroxylase at the initiation of the pathway. Many other things, uh, as I mentioned, play a role in the modulation of this fork in the road, so to speak, for pregnenolone. We know that insulin, insulin-like growth factor, and inhibin promote lyase activity and androstene diome production. This plays a crucial role in the compartmentalization or the two-cell theory. FSH uh, drives granulosa cells to produce inhibin. The inhibin, in effect, has a paracrine uh, impact on the fecal cells with increased production of the antigen substrate through the delta-5 pathway. Other factors inhibit delta-5. Um, that includes activin. Not surprising if inhibin promotes delta-5. One would expect that activin would actually suppress it, uh, leading to production of the shunting via the delta-4 pathway. Other growth factors, including epidermal growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, transforming growth factor beta, and this growth differential factor 9 appear to be crucial um, in the regulation of this very important junction and determining uh, which pathway uh, occurs. It's also important to note that uh, the relative activity, um, and it may go without saying, that the relative activity of CYP17 versus 3-beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase determines whether steroidogenesis proceeds down delta-5 with androgen production substrate and ultimately estrogen production, or progesterone is the end product through the delta-4 pathways. There are numerous cell-specific modulators, chief of which is probably the gonadotropins with 3-beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase and the delta-4 pathway being stimulated by FSH in the granulosa cell um, and LH in the fecal cells. So further compartmentalization um, and differentiation of the response uh, to the gonadotropins. Just when one thought the two-cell theory was simple, there are multiple layers of regulation that time will permit us from going into much detail. Essentially, GNRH signaling, both FSH and LH, although predominantly LH, play, when it comes to the fecal cells, um, starts the cascade of steroidogenesis with modulation by insulin um, and IGF-1, with both with their specific receptors, to have a nuclear effect with modulation of the CYP 17 enzymatic activity, as well as the 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase activity, as one will note in the center of the screen. There's also, as alluded to earlier, direct modulation of STAR and the uptake of cholesterol. The availability of substrate does play a role with LDL and HDL being taken up by the cell and initiating serving as the substrate for steroidogenesis. So just a very cursory view, you'll notice that many genetic factors, the presence of amino acid metabolites, various phospholipids, 
as well as the modulation of the enzymes result in the production of androstenedione and testosterone by the fecal cells. These are then shoveled across the basal lamina into the granulosa cells where a similar but different or compartmentalized function occurs allowing steroidogenesis to proceed. You'll note that the insulin and IGF also play a role through specific receptors impacting CYP19, 17-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase that converts androstenedione to testosterone, as well as 17-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, and ultimately through the production and release of 17-beta-estradiol. Notice as well that FSH, like LH in the fecal cells, goes through many intermediaries, to have a direct impact on the steroidogenic enzymes. There also are of note uh, multiple other cofactors, including BMP15 and BMP16, um, that act on FSH receptor expression, as well as on the secondary messengers or signaling cascade. An interesting uh, quote that I've come across is that activation of the LHH FSH and LH receptor uh, on both the granulosa and the fecal cells involves pretty much every known intracellular signaling pathway, many of which are uh, noted on this slide, but include adenylate cyclase, um, protein kinase C, or inositol phosphate, um, the mitogen activator proteins, or MAP kinase, as well as a whole host of extracellular signaling kinase proteins that are um, important throughout the body. In the fecal cells, the uh, exact signaling in humans it may not be as clear. Animal models, however, demonstrate that there are numerous secondary messengers as well, including the uh, AKT, uh, LH-induced AKT phosphorylation, the MAP kinase that was mentioned previously, um, as well as a host of other uh, secondary messengers. So one gets an appreciation of the fine-tuning or modulation that occurs uh, in steroidogenesis far beyond the simple two-cell theory. However, it is nice to go back and correlate uh, any discussion uh, that can be as dense as steroidogenesis with a visual of something that, that most reproductive endocrinologists know and love and that's the follicle. So in the follicle, fecal cells appear at the secondary uh, follicle stage um, in response to LH binding to the LH receptor, the availability of cholesterol largely through cyclic AMP and PKA convert cholesterol to androstenedione, which through aromatization results in the end product of estradiol which modulated by FSH binding to its receptor um, with secondary messengers, et cetera. So a very nice schematic of the essential backbone of steroidogenesis as it relates to the ovary or to the uh, reproductive endocrinology. Now I mentioned that compartmentalization is not only at the enzymatic level, at the cellular level, but also the temporal level. A very nice review included these slides that looked at regulation of the uh, steroidogenesis relative to the follicular phase. So if one looks at the early follicular phase where uh, follicles are less than 10 to 12 millimeters, there are numerous modulators playing a role in addition to the BMP 6 and 15 that I mentioned earlier, uh, GDF plays a role but there's definitely the potential for the antral follicle to undergo the complete steroidogenesis um, and have pregnenolone alone proceed down both the delta-5 and delta-4 pathway. While that may seem like a minor point, it is really crucial to understand relative to controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. It's practiced in assisted reproductive technology that we'll review very soon. So essentially the ovarian stroma is stimulated, our fecal cells are stimulated by LH 
they largely favor the Delta 5 pathway with androgens being transferred, undergoing aromatization under the stimulatory effects of FSH with largely estrogen production uh, being initiated. So essentially early on, Delta 4 does occur, but it's predominantly Delta 5. As one moves into the late follicular phase, and these are larger follicles, maybe selection of a dominant follicle, then there is, there is a, a noted change. So first of all, fecal cells in response to LH will begin to increase progesterone production. There will also be increased conversion, a greater role of progesterone production from the maturing granulosa cells. So the Delta IV pathway becomes more predominant as one in approaches ovulation um, and ultimately the formation of the corpus luteum. Um, in the luteal phase, one notes that the corpus luteum largely in response to LH, and if pregnancy has occurred, a tremendous impact of human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG, results in a preference for pregnenolone metabolism through the Delta IV pathway in progesterone. That's not to say that estrogen production is not occurring. We know that clinically estradiol and progesterone both increase in the uh, luteal phase, continue support the secretory phase of the um, endometrium, but it's largely a progesterone effect, um, even though both of these pathways are uh, occurring. Now, it's important to know as a practicing reproductive endocrinologist that these steroidogenic pathways do play a role, as I mentioned earlier, in dysregulation of, ov of ovarian steroidogenesis. So this talk begs the question, what role does the enzymatic function play and also in treatment? Uh, we'll talk briefly about premature ovarian insufficiency, formerly known as premature ovarian failure, often called um, somewhat erroneously early menopause. Um, likewise, ovarian failure is not the case, as I'll highlight um, steroidogenesis does proceed in many cases. Finally, polycystic ovarian syndrome is the most common diagnosis that I see in my clinic, and many have estimated may be the most common endocrinopathy in women of reproductive age. While this syndrome has many potential etiologies, it's very clear there is some enzymatic dysfunction. And finally, focusing on what is the bread and butter of IVF or the daily practice of fertility care or the treatment of infertility is superovulation or controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. We'll mainly focus on premature luteinization or in many cases more correctly ter termed premature progesterone elevation. It is clear that ovarian hyperstimulation may be due to some disordered enzymatic function um, but we will not highlight uh, that role in, during this talk. So to begin with premature ovarian insufficiency, enzymatic dysfunction is a well-known etiology of premature ovarian insufficiency with numerous genetic determinants. At almost every step of the in steroidogenesis, um, even from dysregulation of the cytochrome P450 side chain, chain cleavage, or the uptake of cholesterol. Numerous authors uh, have reported on autoantibodies, especially as this paper did in the second bullet in the case of other autoimmune polyglandular syndromes or Addison's disease. A large number of the patients in this series, 90% had antibodies to the cytochrome P450 side uh, chain cleavage, as well as the uh, CYP uh, 17. Um, it's hard to know, um, especially when it comes to ovarian antibodies, which comes first, the horse or the cart. Are the antibodies present because of destruction over of ovarian tissue? Are they an etiology? Um, but it's clear they do play a role, although measuring ovarian antibodies has largely fallen, fallen in disfavor um, for the clinician. 
Uh, we do know that just because someone receives the diagnosis of premature ovarian insufficiency and may have ceased menstrual function or truly be in menopause or premature menopause, the expression of steroidic genetic enzymes continues. In fact, in this series from um, JCEM, they look specifically at patients with well-characterized premature ovarian um, insufficiency or ovarian failure who had undergone ovarian biopsy and found that many of the uh, crucial enzymes that we have talked about throughout this lecture um, were actually in some cases upregulated uh, and in some cases there was um, evidence of excess androgen production and we occasionally see this clinically and it's hard to know the etiology of excess androgens. The patient with uh, in menopause who's complaining of uh, shaving, um, the young woman with premature ovarian failure that actually, actually reports worsening of her androgens may in many cases be due to increased biologic activity of the androgens due to a fall in sex hormone binding globulin or androgen binding protein seen with hypoestrogenism, but there may also be in some cases um, a increased production of ovarian androgens and likely adrenal androgens um, associated with these clinical findings. Um, moving on to polycystic ovarian syndrome, this slide is somewhat dated. I believe it first appeared at Medscape.com in, in 2007 or 2008, uh, but really does a nice job of summarizing the many etiologies of, of PCOS, um, and there are other renditions of this that are far more complex and include everything from brain function to liver function. Almost every organ system in the body has been implicated somewhat in the pathophysiology of polycystic ovarian syndrome. The latest thought is that there's some propensity, possibly genetic, to develop polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, and in many women, increased BMI tips them over the metabolic and reproductive uh, cliff, uh, so to speak, or results in metabolic and, and reproductive dysfunction, largely mediated by insulin resistance and hypoinsulinemia, as this slide indicates, with the clear alterations in the enzymatic pathways both in the ovary and in the adrenal gland. And this is not to say that all PCOS uh, is associated with obesity and insulin resistance. Um, in my own practice, unfortunately, um, because of the high incidence of obesity in our state, it's more than 80 percent. Conversely, if one looks at early studies um, focusing on PCOS, our current studies from other cultures, including Asia, then PCOS is a much more common etiology, but that too may be uh, in part due to enzymatic dysfunction, um, but possibly more at the level of the adrenal gland. We do know um, more recent data suggests that there are multiple enzymatic changes in PCOS. A very nice review from just the last couple months um, in the Journal of Endocrinology was focusing on the, the impact of PCOS on bone health and really did a nice job of summarizing enzymatic dysfunction as playing a role in the pathophysiology and the long-term sequelae of PCOS. Uh, they highlighted uh, what other authors and researchers um, have reported, a decreased aromatase activity, greater androgens, um, increased 17-20 lyase, increased 17-alpha hydroxylase, beta hydroxy uh, steroid dehydrogenase, and finally um, increased 5-alpha reductase activity. Um, it is difficult to correlate clinical features with these uh, changes, but it is important to know there are some simple trends that ultimately result in an increased ovarian production of androgens and a decreased estrogen production. Um, there's not evidence that you clearly shunt away from the delta-4 pathway 
and only favor Delta V um, androgen production, um, I see as more of an overview of a increased activity of most stero many steroidogenic enzymes in the pathway resulting in increased androgen and less conversions um, with the net effect at the micro milieu at the follicular level being the follicular arrest or atresia that we know as polycystic ovarian morphology are, are numerous antral follicles. When one looks further within the subset of patients with PCOS and asks the question, is there a different impact or different steroidogenic activity in patients with PCOS with and without hyperandrogenism, a recent series uh, did, did just that. Many, however, would argue that the true um, metabolic and reproductive dysfunction seen with PCOS is due to androgen excess. However, we're all sometimes painfully aware that according to the Rotterdam criteria, one can have polycystic ovarian morphology and menstrual or ovatory dysfunction in the absence of other endocrinopathies and in the absence of androgen excess on the clinical or laboratory front and receive the diagnosis of PCOS. My European colleagues and others uh, seem to focus a little more on polycystic ovarian morphology as the diagnostic criteria, although I think we all would agree clinically more along the lines of the Androgen Excess Society and others that focus on the um, excess androgen as the key pathologic feature of PCOS. Nonetheless, this paper highlighted the fact that there is a uh, low delta-5 pathway activity or lias activity with hyperandrogenism and found that that correlated with insulin levels, um, with estradiol levels, total testosterone concentrations, uh, total testosterone concentration, and the free androgen index. Conversely, that the greater the androgen ex excess, there seemed to be uh, increased delta-4 activity and increased uh, beta, 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, i.e. DHEA and androstenone production um, associated with androgen excess. It, it makes sense to me that someone with marked features of androgen excess would have enzymatic activity uh, an increase in enzymatic activity that supports androgen production, although it's not clear from a pathophysiologic basis why one would see shunting to the delta-4 pathway um, with androgen excess. So uh, I can't help but uh, postulate that the delta-4 pathway is a result of androgen excess and not directly contributing um, as we talked about before, it may also be that there is some androgen production, although that's largely thought to not occur. And all the studies, or not all of them, but I would say the consensus is that there is decreased aroma, aromatase activity across the board in PCOS, but at least in this series, it appear to be closely associated with androgen excess. Moving on to controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, just to finish up with um, really the bread and butter of, of fertility care, many people talk about premature luteinization, and while the first reference is a, an, an abstract form, I did find it interesting that they demonstrated an increase in premature luteinization in unexplained infertility and most noteworthy in patients with diminished ovarian reserve. Uh, we've all encountered patients with increased inhibin and basal layers of FSH leading to put premature follicular recruitment, and this may play a role um, in the uh, activity, but this is at least a suggestion that steroidogenesis likely through the Delta IV pathway favors progesterone production in some degree with diminished ovarian reserve. It is very important to note that the premature luteinization or probably more appropriately a rise in progesterone is uh, a known complication of controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, negatively out affects outcomes, decreased implantation, decreased ongoing pregnancy rate, and decreased live birth rate 
all due to an altered um, endometrial receptivity uh, in, la in large part. Uh, the first reference I included, I think it's noteworthy. Um, I think they included a review, um, if I recall correctly, of 60,000 um, IVF cycles, so tremendous numbers. The latest is a paper actually from this month, August 2017, Fertility and Sterility, which actually linked the rising progesterone to epigenetic phenomena that negatively impact endometrial receptivity, you know, owing, uh, highlighting the um, epigenetic and potential genetic implications of a premature rise in progesterone. And we all know clinically that this rise in progesterone often dictates care. Many centers will check a progesterone on the day of or the day after um, HCG administration and will convert that cycle uh, to a uh, cryo cycle or require cryopreserve oocytes um, and embryos to avoid this detrimental or decreased endometrial receptivity. Um, it is important to note that uh, there may be some positive predictive value in a very nice paper by my colleagues at NIH, Dr. Hill is the lead author, revisited the concept that the progesterone to oocyte ratio um, actually has a predictive factor, which really leads us to the, the thought that the rise in progesterone is a physiologic process. Um, it is not the same as premature luteinization. Luteinization, by definition, is the uh, conversion of granulosa cells to largely progesterone production and is clearly a, a detriment to pregnancy and one that's a well-known clinical entity. But we often get stuck on the fact that progesterone is made um, a great indicator of ovulation um, at, with production by the corpus luteum. But progesterone production begins even in the smallest follicles and increases really in a linear fashion. It's also progesterone is so commonly associated uh, with the luteal phase, but in fact FSH actually increases or induces the LH receptors on the granulosa cells, which results in progesterone production very early in the follicular genesis. LH in turn uh, increases, conversely increases uh, CYP17, would act, which actually would favor the delta-5 pathway. So clearly LH binding plays a role in progesterone elevation, but is in fact FSH early in follicular genesis that drives early progesterone production via the delta-4 pathway when in fact early LH stimulation, um, especially at the fecal cells, favors androgen production that becomes a substrate. So in summary, on the middle of the slide, we must not forget that more follicles and more FSH, i.e. exogenous FSH, recombinant FSH, leads to greater progesterone production earlier. So the rise in progesterone seen with controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, to quote my friend and colleague, Dr. Hill, is both intrinsic to patient factors and the result of controlled ovarian hyperstimulation has some positive predictive value. Clearly at certain levels will impact implantation and have a detrimental effect, but we must not lose sight of the physiologic process that's occurring and be guilty of only focusing on the bad role of progesterone in our fresh stems, our controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, our IVF cycles. So in summary, I hope you found the, um, this talk beneficial and has given you a new or greater understanding of um, steroidogenesis, um, ovarian steroidogenesis and the production of sex steroids which are the hallmark of reproductive function, is the result of a complex interplay of substrate availability, enzymatic function, and end product necessity. It's under the dynamic regulation of a host of autocrine, paracrine, and endocrine factors. Um, it is absolutely crucial to, for reproductive endocrinologists to understand the steroid pathway for the proper evaluation of reproductive disorders,
and really to optimize management of our patients, um, including those who are only seeking assisted reproductive technologies. And a colleague of mine once said that a reproductive endocrinologist who doesn't have a basic understanding of steroidogenesis um, may fall to the level of the technician. And I challenge each of us to uh, seek out greater understanding of the physiologic and pathophysiologic processes that result in successful uh, reproduction. And thank you for your attention.